shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, we got it. Um, that was very nice. Yeah. Thank you for offering to share that. Uh, okay. We are. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, again, happy Mother's Day. I am really excited to be here, to be standing here today. Uh, to introduce a new class that we're going to be starting. So the timing of all this, I was not supposed to be, I wasn't scheduled to be teaching for the last, uh, today will be three weeks now. Um, but I've been, I was honored to ask to do that. Well, today is the beginning of uh, a new month. And um, who was, Rolando, I think, right? Rolando's going to be teaching. He was scheduled to teach today, but had some other obligations and was unable to, so I was asked to fill in again today. He's going to be picking up next week, as I understand, for the next three weeks, and then I'll start again. I'm teaching class in uh, all of June and July. So what we're starting today is actually going to be the introduction and the first lesson, if you will, in the class that I'll be starting in earnest, right, beginning in July or in uh, June. And you may be able to see that the title of the class is called Words to Live By. And this is a class I developed, I don't know, a couple of three, four, five years back, whenever it was. And um, it was in the development and the preparation and everything of this subject matter uh, was had a really profound impact on me. Some of these words that we're going to be looking at, and, and the whole series, what we're doing here is just identifying and then kind of hopefully doing a somewhat of a deep dive into specific words. They're, you know, they're, they're not words that are used outside of a church kind of an environment. They're words that we're all familiar with, um, but they're not necessarily words that we always like try to peel the layers of that onion back, right? To really try to understand the significance of these specific words. So you think about words like, uh, is anybody, if I asked anyone, maybe besides Troy, he might be the only one that can get this, but generally speaking, is there anyone that can define the word propitiation? See, it's, it's one of the, but we all, we're familiar with the word, right? We know that it's in the scripture. We know that there's something significant about that word. Um, some other words may be a little bit easier. Redemption, maybe if we fumbled through it, right? Fumbled and stumbled, we might be able to come up with something there. Um, um, uh, justification, can anybody define justification for me or just justify? Yeah. Right? So those kind of words. And so that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be taking a, a really good look. Some of these words are gonna take, justification for example, is gonna take us two weeks. Uh, it is such a significant, has such significant meaning. And um, so anyway, as we get into this, just kind of try to wrap your head around this whole idea of words and the significance. You understand that the words we speak have meaning. Words have meaning. And in our society today, the the very words that we have grown up with, the words that we have come to understand and use in certain ways, these words are being redefined to some degree, aren't they? And, and so it's important for us to understand not only what the words are, but to understand the meaning that the Spirit of our Lord originally intended when he you know, inspired the apostle or the writer, whoever it was, to include that word for that specific description, situation, whatever it was, right? Why did he select that word? And that's what we're going to be looking at. So I hope you enjoy it and, and appreciate it and maybe most of all learn from it and, and that it will affect your life. So we're going to start this today. And then, like I said, the first of June, we're going to, uh, we're going to pick up and, and continue on through there. So, um, if I ask and this one, I, I have a lot more confidence. I think most of us could probably get this. If I asked us to, to recite together John 1 1, did most of us get that? Right? In the say it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? So we're familiar with that. We understand that the Word in that context is speaking of whom? Jesus. Right. Speaking of the Christ, speaking of Jesus, right? And But it's really interesting. Why didn't John just start out by saying, in the beginning, Jesus was with God? In fact, Jesus was God. 
Why didn't he just say that? Wouldn't it have been a lot simpler? Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, but he didn't. He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and most importantly, the word was God. Was God. Right? And the word is still with us. And the word is absolutely still with us. You bet your bottom dollar he is. Right? So in this context, the word word is not used the same way that it is, the, the same way that we're going to be using the word. Okay? So, um, but I, I wanted to start with John 1.1 1, 1 because it's important to understand that um, the, the definition of the word word is uh, as an embodying idea. It is a statement or a speech, right? But this right here, as an embodying idea, is really what is applied to John 1.1. 1, 1. Because the Greek, the, the Greek word, you, you've probably heard this before, the Greek word is logos. What we would say L-O-G-O-S, right? Um, the, the Greeks had this idea that there was a, of course, they didn't understand Jehovah God. They didn't understand creation in the same way that, that we understand it now, right? But they did have this idea that there was some great first cause, okay? Let that sink in for just a minute. There is some great first cause of everything, okay? And the way, in their ignorance, and that's what Paul called it when he was on Mars Hill, right, in Acts chapter 17, he says, I was walking through your uh, places of worship, and I saw all these, these other idols, or, or uh, I saw this altar that you had created to an unknown God, okay? And Paul said, what you worship, what you look to in ignorance, I'm about to tell you who this unknown God is. Right. And so the Greeks were philosophers like par excellence. Right. I mean, that was what they did. Mars Hill, when he went there, that was a place that the Greeks assembled to talk philosophy, to talk about these great ideas. And they're the ones the, the Greek language that was originally uh, used to write the New Testament. They're the ones that prompted this. Right. So when John inspired by the Holy Spirit, the, the prompt for using this word in this place for this description, that's what it comes from. The word is the great first cause of everything. Amen. Okay. So that's, that's kind of our jumping off point. So when we get to, uh, well, we just talked about that. Um, my transitions aren't very great there. And I didn't take a lot of time to get this first part set up on the transition. So, uh, this is really kind of our theme verse for the entire class. John 6, verse 63. Look at that if you've got your Bibles open. And again, this is just kind of our introductory material here, but this is, again, the foundation for what we're doing, okay? John 6, 63. I've got it right there on the screen if you don't have your Bible. Um, he says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. So here, now this is, of course, Jesus speaking, right? We all understand that. The word, the great first cause, has spoken to us the words that are spirit and life. So what we can count on with 100% confidence, if if he is, if we believe the Greeks approach to it, right, the Greek, that, that he is the great first cause, and as John wrote, that in the beginning the word was God, if we believe that, then what we also must believe is that whatever words come out of this man's mouth, this Jesus the Nazarene, that the words that he speaks are infallible. They are 100% always, every time, as he says, the words of spirit and life, yeah. right? Are we in agreement with that? Yes. Okay. As long as we're in agreement with that, then we've got a, a common place from which we can kind of launch into this study, okay? So that's our objective. Let me see what else. The great first cause is the one who gave us the words. You can see that. These are some of the words we're gonna be looking at. 
And we're actually going to be starting with reconciliation. And there's a reason that I put this one first. I hope we're able to get to that. And this is one of my favorite ones, the word freedom. And what we're going to see is it has little to nothing to do with what we as Americans call freedom. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Amen. Um, so that's, uh, we may save that one for last. Um, but anyway, that's one of my, my studying this word freedom. This is not an exaggeration. Studying the word freedom, especially in the context of Galatians chapter five, the first four verses, um, changed my life literally changed my life. It changed the way that I view God. It changed the way that I view you, right? I mean, just other brothers and sisters it changed the way that I look at that, the way that I look at the world around me, the way that I respond to what's happening. Um, I don't watch the news at all. Amen. Because it really doesn't matter. Right. We understand. Anyway, I could start preaching here and I'm not going to do that. So, um, OK, so we're going to start today with the word reconcile and what we'll see here. And every week you're going to see this. All right. This is kind of our template to get the classes launched every week. So I want us to never lose sight of the fact that it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits 50 percent of our value. Right. Know what it says? No. Flesh profits nothing. OK. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit in our life. So that's where we're going. Let's look at reconcile. These are some uh, related words here, reconciled, reconciliation. And here's one maybe that we wouldn't normally associate with being related, but the word peace. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. And it's related in its very definition to the word reconcile. Okay. So this, this, by the way, what we're going to do today is kind of the format for this entire class going forward. Okay. We're going to look at the word, a couple of related words. We're going to look at some definitions and then we're going to look at some key scriptures and try to unpack those scriptures as we go through this. So OxfordDictionaries.com uh, defines this as to restore friendly relations. I don't need to read all these. I know you can, you guys can read all these uh, to settle a quarrel, but just because I don't have to read them doesn't necessarily mean that I won't be reading <laughs> <clears throat> to win over to friendliness, uh, to compose or settle dispute, we see all that. And here now we get into the actual biblical use of the words. Thayer's is a, uh, are you guys, anyone here from Mayor and Troy, probably in your studies, but uh, Thayer's Greek English lexicon, Ashlyn, yeah, she's, she's used that book. Okay. I've used it just that I am familiar, like I knew yeah, what it is. You read it on your shelf. <laughs> She's seen it, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so anyway, that's what we're going to be using. It will help us to get the definition of the word as it's used in the scriptures. Um, and uh, so you'll see this here. Okay, to change or exchange as coins for others of equivalent value. We're familiar with how this is used, like an accountant, right? A bookkeeper would reconcile the book. So a cashier reconciles the cash drawer at the end of her shift, you know, something like that. Um, that's what that is. But really what we're looking at more is um, the, the sub definitions to reconcile those who are at variance. That's important. Uh, to return to favor with, to be reconciled to one, to receive one into favor. That A though, to reconcile those who are at variance is a really important distinction for us to identify as we move into this, okay? There has to be a variance in order for there to be reconciliation. Because if there's no variance, no reconciliation is needed, right? It's like if we were if we were in right standing with God, we wouldn't need to be saved, would we? Right. Right? There would have been no reason for Jesus to come to begin with. Okay? So here let's start with some of these key scriptures. And as we look at these, and we're starting in uh, Romans chapter 5, this passage in Romans 5, boy, I wish we could really dive into this. There are a couple of things that Paul writes here that are um, absolutely profound. And beginning in verse 6, our entire script, our passage here is verses 6 through 11. We're not going to unpack this entire section. But I've got noted, highlighted up here, verse 10. But I want us to start in verse 6 for just a moment. So Romans 6 and verse 6, or, uh, 5 and verse 6, Romans 5 and verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for whom? Ungodly. 
He died for the ungodly. Christ died for ungodly people. All right. As we continue on through this, then uh, in verse 10, we see that for if we were, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, right? Because we were at variance, we were at odds with God. That's why the reconciliation had to take place, right? All right. So if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, past tense, he says here, having been reconciled. So the reconciliation has taken place now. Having been reconciled, we, we shall be saved by his life. So what we see starting out here in verse 6 is that Christ died for only ungodly people. He says, um, <clears throat> is that it? I think it? Was there another spot here? No, that's it. So, um, again, if, if we were godly people, if the world was a godly place, Christ would not have had to die. Good. So the fact that, uh, that he died for the ungodly should give us a moment of pause to understand our condition and our position and our relation, right? Our relationship to God. We were ungodly. We were the opposite of God in that context. And in that context, God over here in his righteousness and everything that is God, everything that is God, and we were down here, completely and totally separated, ungodly, completely and totally unlike this one, right? And it is in that condition, that, that level of separation, that hopeless state in which we existed that Christ died for us. And as a result of his death, that reconciliation, that variance between the two places and states and, and persons, right? That variance was eliminated. And it's all because of the death of Christ. But here's what I want us to understand. Yeah, let, let me, I'll come to that here in a minute. All right, any questions about this so far? I'm going to be moving kind of quick this morning because of the introduction, and, and, um, and I want to make sure that we get as much of this covered as we can. So any questions? We're tracking so far? Okay. So uh, a couple of points to recognize. Hostility exists prior to reconciliation. Right, and we've kind of touched on that. It is God initiated, which is really, really important for us to understand. We didn't do anything to, to get this ship out of uh, out of port, right? God initiated the whole thing, Amen. right? Okay, and atonement is made to facilitate reconciliation. So that's when he says in verse ten, uh, "We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son." That's a reference to the atonement that took place at the cross. So atonement is necessary to facilitate reconciliation. There has, something has to be done with whatever caused the separation, right? That, that, that thing, whatever it was, or things, they have to be addressed. They can't just be swept under the rug. So as a result of the, the heinous, nature of the crimes, if you will, if you'll allow that harsh of a word, as a result of the heinous nature of the crimes that we have committed against God, something had to be done. And that's where atonement became necessary. And that's why it was absolutely imperative. I mean, it couldn't have been done any other way that God had to be the one to initiate it. Right? Okay. Um, Larry, yes, sir. That, that step that you're speaking of in the gospel <laughs> message uh, is, is so important. Sometimes we, we having grown up with it, we, we gloss over it or we just take it for granted. But <clears throat> people think of sin today as some kind of, it's something light. 
It's something just to make to make fun of. It's something you know not to about to, yeah, or to brag about, or to you know, um, or it's something that is easily dismissed uh, when, when you accidentally go through an aisle at a theater and step on somebody's toe. You know, uh, you you say excuse me, and they say, oh no problem, it's all right. Right. And we think that's kind of like sin, right. and it's not. Yeah. That's not right. at all like that. Yeah. Anyway. And, and so one of the words we're actually going to be looking at here later on in the class is the word glory. And what we're going to learn about the word glory is going to, is really kind of um, at least incorporates what you're talking about here. And, and it is the glory of God. And what does that look like? What exactly is it? What does it mean to us? And, and um, anyway, it's going to be, it, it will incorporate some of what you just talked about in that. All right, so now we're in Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 20 through 22. And actually, I'm going to start in verse 19 just because in my translation, that's the beginning of the sentence, right? So this is Paul writing to the Colossian church, and he's speaking. There is um, what scholars refer to as high Christology in the opening part of the Colossian letter, just like the Ephesian letter as well. But this is Paul writing about the almost really unbelievable characteristics and qualities of the Christ, right? Um, so it, like in verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have, be, have been created through him and for him. He's speaking of the Christ. He's trying to impress upon the Colossian believers who this man is that they have decided to follow, right? And they're running into some problems. There are people trying to upset the church. That's why Paul wrote most of the letters that he wrote was to try to combat some kind of problem that was going on there, right? So when we move down to verse 19, uh, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him, through the Christ, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him, I say, whether things in heaven or on earth. And look at verse 21. And although you were formerly what? Alienated. alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. In, 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 in spite of all of that, he continues, yet now uh, he, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you. This is, listen, this next statement here in verse um, 22 is at the core for why reconciliation, why God wanted and had to facilitate reconciliation, okay? Listen carefully. Verse 22, I'm going to start. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to, this is a purpose statement, okay? He's saying, what, and Paul, you get this a lot from Paul's writing. I love the way he does it because it's a very kind of if-then kind of stuff. It's easy if we're paying attention, looking for it, right? And he says, because he's done this, he did it because he could, uh, or so that he could present you before him, before Jehovah, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. God initiated what he initiated so that this gap, this variance, actually what Paul writes, this hostility, we were enemies with Christ, right? We're enemies with God. We all understand that, right? God did this. Jesus did this so that on judgment day, he can present to us, I'm sorry, present to God. He can present us to God as holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Why do you think it's so important why is it so important that we be presentable in this way? Fully impure. Okay. I think he can be around anything that's not. Yeah, he is wholly impure. All right. Um, 
the idea that he can't be around, because I've had that, I've really struggled with this, honestly, about him not being able to be around anything that is unholy or impure. And because I, I honestly, I don't know if that's the case, really. It may be. Um, but I don't know, because we think, you know, Jesus was a man. He walked on the face of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. What was he walking around? Who was he dealing with? People. People who were unholy and impure, right? So God can, at least in some state, he can be around it, right? So why is it necessary that he be able to present us as holy and was it blameless and beyond reproach? Tori and then Urban. Urban, go ahead, Urban. Okay, go ahead, Urban. He's wanting to present us to his heavenly Father so that we will not break his heart. Sin breaks God's heart. Oh, I don't think there's any question about and, that. And he didn't want us to be there in that condition. We couldn't be there in that condition. Right. So he had to die for us. That's where the atonement is. Yes. Absolutely. He, yeah. Go ahead, Troy. I guess uh, to kind of speak to your earlier thought, uh, Jesus coming to us, Jesus could come to us, um, but we could not come to him. There you go. That's a good point. Um, he, he had that ability, whereas we did not. Right. Uh, because of our because of our nature, our, our, our condition. Yeah. Um, you, you are obviously correct about that. The, the only, the counter I would offer to that, if, if what we're trying to determine here or discuss is whether or not God can be around evil, right? Or just not even what we might call evil, just unholiness, right? That, that stepping on someone's toe as we're walking down the, the theater aisle. Um, <clears throat> Oh, boy. Oh, man, I want to take you somewhere. We just don't have the time for it. Let me just say this. In, in the 82nd Psalm, the psalmist makes a statement. I'm going to take you here real quick. We're going to have to come back to this and study it at another time if you guys really want to get into this. But um, let, me, let me just share something with you. And it, it may... Um, did you say 87th or 82nd? 82, Psalm 82. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm really hesitant to bring this up because there, there's so much to this, uh, but I want you to see something. Uh, beginning of verse 1. God takes his stand in his own congregation. Or some of them may say, uh, it, God takes a stand in the congregation of God. Does any of, any of your translations read like that? Okay. God takes a stand in his own congregation. So where where is this this assembly? Where is this taking place? In heaven. It's in the heaven somewhere, right? Um, he judges in the midst of the gods. Do any of your translations read that way? It has quotes around gods, but yeah. Quotes around gods. Okay. Does your what translation you use, Jenny? NIV. Okay. And it says it's among the gods, but in quotes. But in quotes. In lower case. It is lower case. Here's what I want you to understand about this passage. <laughs> when it says in verse one, if you go back and we do a Hebrew investigation of this, okay? God, Elohim. God takes a stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the Elohim is the, the Hebrew word that is there. It's the same word used to de describe or it was translated as God that we would understand as Jehovah. And it's the same word as the gods in quotes, Elohim. The reason I bring this up in the context of what we're talking about is that um, if you go ahead and read through the rest of the 82nd Psalm, what you realize is that the gods, the reason this assembly in the midst of the congregation has taken place is because Jehovah God is judging the gods because they were not doing what they were called. To, they were not doing, listen to this, they were not doing what God had assigned them to do. Okay, you can read it. I'm telling you, that's what it is. 
He had set them over. See, I told you we needed more time to talk about this stuff. So let me get back. All right, so we can come back to this later, okay? But here's, so when we talk about God being in the presence of evil, yes, he could come to us, we can't go to him. But in this context, um, there is evil going on even in the heavenly places and God's in the midst of the congregation, right? So that's the only reason I went here. So when we talk about this reconciliation, I think it goes deeper, honestly. And that's why I wanted us to get to this. I think this goes deeper. Why did God have to do what he did? Why would he have even cared about reconciling us to begin with, right? And Troy, and then Ashton, and then Chip. I think that's the order I saw. Well, I, this I thought of this verse at the very beginning was John 3, 16. Sure. For God so loved. Okay. So there, there is a, it's, it's not just a law thing. Um, normally we think of it in legal aspects or forensically. We think of it as, well, this had to be set right. And the books had to be set straight. Reconciliation had to take place. Yes. It, it's more than just a law thing. Absolutely. God is more than just a judge. He is a loving father. And yes. we have to incorporate that into our theology when we do this. Okay. God so perfect. loved the world. This is perfect. And, and the reason I'm not going real deep into the love aspect is my understanding is that's what Rolando is going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks, right? Uh, either love all three weeks or faith, hope, and love or something like that. So we'll be able to have the opportunity to explore this. But that really is. So what did John, in, in 1 John, how did he describe? In John, 1 John 4 and verse 8, he said, God is love, right? It's an inherent part of his, his nature, his being. It is the ultimate description of the character of God, that he is love, okay? That's why he even wanted reconciliation to begin with. That's why he ever spoke in the beginning, let there be light. That's why he ever said, let us make man in our own image, was because that is the essence of love. He wanted to love us, and he still wants to love us. If he didn't, he would have never created us to begin with, right? Object, uh, uh, love must have an object. We don't just love. We love things and a kind of a casual use of the word, or we love people. Yes. Um, thank you. I get on the roll again. All right, Ashlyn. Hey, can I, am I allowed to say no? I, I call on yes. <laughs> Um, no, essentially, I was going to say something similar, but um, the whole reason that God, I feel like, created man was to have a relationship with us. Yes. And so he is trying to reestablish that relationship Yes. that he intended us for in the, in the beginning. And that comes from love, so it's connected, but it, I mean, it is a little bit... So, yes, absolutely. And that's why it's re reconciled, right? Yes. We can conciliate, but to reconciliate means you have to do something again. You have to fix a problem, right, Chip? The two of y'all made the point I want to The only thing I would add to it is that since Christ has come, we can now approach God. Yes. Oh, man, that's the beautiful part of this. When we get into... Um, like Hebrews, not that that's part of our study necessarily, but when, when we understand that because of the blood of Christ, because of this reconciliation, that we now have been given not only permission just to say, if you want to, you can, but we've been literally invited into the throne room of God, the throne room of God we can approach him boldly boldly and ask right to do so oh man listen if you if you get nothing else except for this idea this understanding that we can approach god we can come into his very presence that's why he reconciled us okay let me i know i see a couple of hands let me just try to get through okay. this last couple of things we only got a couple of minutes um <laughs> Because I want to hear what you guys have to say, but I just, um, all right. So reconciliation results in peace, right? So we see that in Colossians 1, uh, where he says he reconciled all things to himself, having made peace, right? So the opposite of hostility is peace, isn't it? So we were in one condition before, we're in another condition after as a result of that. 
Uh, here we have a, the idea of atonement mentioned again. And um, okay, so we won't necessarily look at this, but this passage in Ephesians 2, again, speaking of the Christ, so that, he, that it in himself he might make the two, speaking of Jew and Greek, or Jew and Gentile at this point, might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace between Jew and Gentile, and might reconcile them both. So together, he might reconcile them both, uh, as I say, in one body to God through the cross. And again, through the cross, we get the idea of atonement again in here. But this last statement, by it, by the cross, having put to death the enmity, that is the hostility, that is the conflict, that was all put to death at the cross, right? As long as we believe in the work of the cross. All right, Jew and Gentile, yeah. The, the peace between Jew and Gentile is actually a byproduct of our peace with God. Uh, oh, there we go, again, transition. All right, so last couple of things here. What does it all mean? Somebody's been in my PowerPoint messing up with these uh, these transitions here. So we'll start at number three and see where, where we go from there. <laughs> what does it all mean? The wrong is righted through the cross. That's atonement again. The wrong must be righted as a bridge to reconciliation. This is one of the things that we're going to learn when we study justification, right, is, is what it means to be justified and why that is so important. Uh, reconciliation is peace where hostility previously existed. And then peace with God offers no excuse. This is that like an application part of the lesson, if you will. Uh, you know, how are we supposed to take this information and in, when we leave here? Peace with God offers no excuse for hostility towards other, even those who have grievously offended us. When, you, when we really understand the absolute hopeless nature of our separation from God before Jesus. And then we contrast that with the absolute peace and love and, and um, uh, just the, this new relationship that we have with God and, and understanding that we had <clears throat> nothing to do with it, right? Other than believing what he said, we had nothing to do with it. And if we really understand our before and after condition, we have no excuse to be nasty to anybody else. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> enjoy your Sunday. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. There's just one thing that I, I'm just dying to say. Okay, one last thing. Urban is dying to say it. <laughs> we can never enter boldly into the presence of God unless we are covered by the blood of Jesus. Yes. And we get into Jesus Christ through baptism. Yeah. And that's where we need to realize our salvation line. That I need to. Yeah. Um, the blood of Jesus. It is the he blood did of Jesus. It. Yeah, and that's why he mentioned in a couple of verses. It was it all revolves around the cross, right? And our response to what happened on, on Calgary on that Friday. All right. Yes, ma'am. So when God created the experience Adam and Eve, and He had a relationship with them, until she ate from 